Hi, I'm Norm Roblog, founder of the Digestive Health Institute and creator of the Fast Track Diet. Today's topic is gut dysbiosis and how to fix it. What is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is a negative shift in the microbial communities within the small or large intestine, resulting in health conditions or symptoms. Generally speaking, it's an imbalance of gut microbes compared to healthy individuals. What health conditions are linked to dysbiosis? There are many, and some have argued that most health issues begin in the gut. But some prominent conditions include IBS, GERD, chronic fatigue syndrome, interstitial cystitis, rosacea, inflammatory bowel disease, fibromyalgia, fatty liver disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, asthma, autoimmune disease, obesity, epilepsy, and many more. Symptoms of dysbiosis vary, but may include bloating, distension, abdominal pain, gas, flatulence, heartburn, belching, fatigue, headache, food sensitivities, even rashes, and diarrhea or constipation. Now, let's talk about the types of dysbiosis. There are basically five types of dysbiosis, including SIBO, SIFO, LIBO, EMO, and dysbiotic strain imbalances. In the small intestine, we have SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and SIFO for small intestinal fungal overgrowth. In the large intestine, there is LIBO for large intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and EMO for intestinal methanogen overgrowth. There are also dysbiotic strain imbalances that may impact both the small and the large bowel. This is where stool testing shows the presence of either a variety of pathogenic organisms or significant deviations of normal commensal organisms from a healthy consensus population, such as an overgrowth of proteobacteria, a shift in the ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes type of bacteria, or missing keystone strains such as Archimensum eosinophila or Faecalibacterium prosnitzii, and more. Each type of dysbiosis involves unique imbalances within our microbial communities. It's important to understand which types of dysbiosis you may have because the treatment options will vary. Also, keep in mind that there is a wide variation in individual microbiomes even among healthy individuals. Therefore, this variation requires discretion when evaluating comprehensive stool test results beyond the summary page. And this requires in-depth understanding and expertise in microbiology and physiology. Now, let's take a closer look at each type of dysbiosis. How prevalent is each one? And what are the significant microbiological shifts in each case? For SIBO, about 50 to 65% of people with IBS symptoms have SIBO based on excess hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide production detected with breath testing. The type of bacteria in SIBO or the types of bacteria include small intestinal inhabitants such as Streptococcus and Villanella, as well as bacteria migrating from the large intestine. Some of those include E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Bacteroides, Prevotella, Clostridia, and Fusobacteria. Although recent work by the Pemintel group is highlighting a prominent role for the proteobacterial strains E. coli and Klebsiella, at least in hydrogen predominant SIBO. For more information, see my How to Fix SIBO and Prevent Recurrence video. The detection of excess hydrogen sulfide indicates the presence of active hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. These include Desulfovibrio species, members of the Fusobacterium genus, and other groupings of bacteria capable of producing this gas. This is considered a subset of SIBO. Diagnosis is made using a breath test called Triosmot. This test is like a standard breath test, but it can also detect hydrogen sulfide. In the case of SIFO, for small intestinal fungal overgrowth, about 25% of patients with unexplained GI symptoms, such as belching, bloating, indigestion, nausea, diarrhea, and gas, have SIFO. We normally have small numbers of fungi in our gut, but too many, particularly in the small intestine, can be a problem. Species offending fungi include mostly Candida albicans, but also C. tropicalis, C. cruzii, and other fungal strains. A type of dysbiosis that is certainly underreported is something I refer to as LIBO for large intestinal bacterial overgrowth. 
While the exact percentage of LIBO in IBS patients is unknown, it might be quite high. LIBO is detected with pH sensing SMOT pills in the cecum and ascending colon as increased acid compared to healthy controls. The acid comes from increased bacterial growth, fermentation, and the production of short chain fatty acids that lower the pH. These studies indicate more extensive growth of bacteria in the early large bowel of IBS patients relative to healthy controls. In other words, the presence of, of LIBO. And what about the bacterial types in LIBO? IBS patients tend to have higher levels of Firmicutes type of bacteria over Bacteroidetes, which is the opposite of a healthy population. So this would be one thing to look at, though we really don't know for sure at this point. Regarding EMO, we're talking about an overgrowth of methane producing archaea organisms, a condition common in patients with uh, constipation predominant IBS. This represents approximately half of IBS patients or five to 10% of the population in the US. EMO used to be part of a SIBO diagnosis, but when uh, high levels of methane were detected. Since these methanogens are not bacteria, we now refer to this as intestinal methanogen overgrowth or EMO. Most EMO mainly occurs or involves an overgrowth of methanobrevibacter smithii and mostly in the large intestine, but M. smithii has also been identified in the small intestine. Now, let's talk about how to determine if you have one or more types of dysbiosis. SIBO is diagnosed using lactulose hydrogen breath testing. The definition of a positive test is greater than 20 parts per million of hydrogen over the baseline sample by 90 minutes. If taking the TRIO SMART test greater than or equal to 3 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide at any point in the test is diagnostic for H2S, or hydrogen sulfide SIBO. For CIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, there is no standard test at this point. However, it is possible to sample the small intestine via endoscopy and quantitate the amount of fungal growth. This was done by Dr. Satish Rao, a gastroenterologist at Augusta University who helped define a CIFO diagnosis. And while this method is a bit invasive, it might be worth it if someone is really struggling and they can't get to the bottom of things. According to Dr. Rao, a positive test is defined as having greater than a thousand fungal cells per milliliter. For LIBO, like CIFO, there's no standard test, but it may be possible to get tested in a teaching hospital such as John Hopkins because they have access to smart pill technology that can measure changes in intestinal pH. And that's how the LIBO connection was initially made. Another possible alternative is to get a comprehensive stool test. I routinely analyze stool test results from my clients, looking at the numbers of different bacterial species and their ratio, and the ratio of the major groupings, some of which may be indicative of LIBO. Also, a negative lactulose breath test and the presence of symptoms and excess gas may be indicative of LIBO. For EMO, it's also diagnosed using a lactulose breath test, but in this case, they're looking for methane gas levels. This can be done in conjunction with a SIBO breath test. High levels of methane greater than 10 parts per million at any point in the test indicates an overgrowth of methanogen. Dysbiosis are challenging to diagnose, but there are definitive actions you can take to impact all forms of dysbiosis. Now, what about treatments? Each form of dysbiosis will respond differently to various treatments, but they have one thing in common. They are all fed directly or indirectly by undigested carbohydrates via a molecular food chain. Bacteria fermenting mostly carbohydrates produce large amounts of hydrogen that can be further processed by a variety of microbes into methane, hydrogen sulfide, and other products. SIBO and LIBO bacteria, depending on the strains, feed on a wide range of mostly carbohydrates from simple sugars to complex fibers and starches, while CIFO feeds on simple sugars. EMO or methanogens use hydrogen for fuel, but that hydrogen comes from bacteria that are fermenting mostly carbohydrates. Likewise, sulfate reducing bacteria also depend on hydrogen to produce hydrogen sulfide this is why I always recommend dietary and behavioral interventions first. Reducing fermentable material in your diet and improving digestion is critical for addressing all forms of dysbiosis while also identifying and addressing potential underlying or contributing causes. 
and these would be specific to your case. The goal is to put your microbes on a diet by limiting fermentable carbohydrates and improving digestion through root cause analysis and potentially via supplementation. By taking our foot off the hydrogen fuel gas pedal, our various control mechanisms such as stomach acid, bile, a healthy mucus layer, improved digestion, motility in our immune system are better able to modulate these populations. Keep in mind 30 grams of unabsorbed carbohydrates allow bacteria to produce 10 liters of gas. Imagine 10 liters of gas in your small or large intestine. And this gas can be converted to methane and hydrogen sulfide. We'll come back to diet and underlying causes later. But for now, let's take a look at mainstream treatment options, each form of dysbiosis. For hydrogen predominant SIBO, herbal protocols include one from the University of Pittsburgh and Johns Hopkins using a combination of oil of oregano, berberine, antibiofilm en enzymes, and other supplements. Also, combinations of allicin, neem, berberine, and other antimicrobial herbals are used by many practitioners based on their antimicrobial properties. But there's a distinct lack of published studies on these types of treatment. Pharmaceutical antibiotics for SIBO include rifaximin, as well as some systemic antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and others. Rifaximin is popular because it's a broad spectrum antibiotic, meaning that it inhibits a wide range of strains and it's less toxic because it's not absorbed into systemic circulation. And rifaximin is approved by the FDA for IBSD, a SIBO-related condition. Other antibiotics prescribe, are prescribed for various reasons or if rifaximin doesn't work. For hydrogen sulfide SIBO, bismuth may be effective alone or with rifaximin, though again, the data is sparse. Allison Seebecker and colleagues published an online survey regarding treatment responses, reporting that the most significant responses were with people on a low sulfur diet or people taking bismuth. Leading some support to this idea, bismuth binds to hydrogen sulfide, which may help with symptoms. For CFO, Pharmaceutical antifungals are most recommended. Fluconazole, for instance, is recommended by Dr. Rao. Nystatin is also a possibility. In fact, one good thing about nystatin is that it's not systemically absorbed, which is better in terms of toxicity. But there is still a question about how well this drug survives at the stomach with the stomach acid. Some data in infants suggest that the probiotic Saccharomyces boulardii and Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG might also be effective. There are also supplement and herbal treatments which include castor oil, caprylic acid, as well as olive, as well as olive leaf extract, berberine, and NAC or N-acetylcysteine. There is some thought they may help with biofilms. In general, the data supporting these herbal treatments is limited. And keep in mind, we actually depend on healthy biofilms on the mucosal surface and Disrupting those is there's a real question mark there if that's something you want to do or not. Now, about LIBO, since LIBO is a relatively new concept, there are more questions than answers about antibiotic use. But one thing that's clear, rifaximin will likely not help with this overgrowth because it requires bile for optimal activity and most of the bile is reabsorbed by the end of the small intestine. But other antibiotics including neomycin, cipro, metronidazole may be options. Now, what about emo? If you're constipated, regardless of your methane levels, it's important to check any medications and even supplements you're taking for side effects because many medicines cause constipation and some supplements as well. The probiotic Lactobacillus ruteri is uh, supported at least by one study showing it can reduce constipation and methane levels to some extent. For antibiotics, the top choice is a combination of rifaximin and neomycin for inhibiting these methanogens. Herbals such as allicin, oregano, and neem may also help, but again, the efficacy of these herbs has not been proven in scientific studies. There are some positive reviews in caprylic acid, but not a lot of work has been done on this approach. Although these pharmaceutical and some herbal treatments are becoming mainstream, the first line of therapy for all types of gut dysbiosis, in my view, should comprise one, diet, two, gut-friendly behaviors, three, root cause analysis, and four, supplementation to address known 
or suspected deficiencies. And here's why. SIBO and LIBO bacteria are fed primarily by a wide range of carbohydrates. C4 fungi are fed by simple sugars. EMO or meth uh, methanogens and sulfate reducing bacteria, both fed by hydrogen gas, produced from the bacteria. As I mentioned, 30 grams of unabsorbed carbohydrates allow bacteria to produce 10 liters of gas. So whether C SIBO, CIFO, LIBO, or EMO, you need to reduce both the overgrowth and the gases produced by the overgrowth, whether bacteria, sulfate reducing bacteria, fungi, or methanogens. Excess microbial end products, including gas levels, play a key role in damage and symptoms. So putting your gut microbes on a diet by limiting fermentable carbohydrates and matching your diet with your ability to efficiently digest and absorb those nutrients must be part of the treatment. Gut-friendly behaviors and practices are often overlooked, but they're critical as part of the overall treatment plan. In addition to what you eat, when you eat, meal spacing, snacking, even how you prepare meals and store leftovers can be important. Do you eat on the run? Do you grab a snack bar? Do you eat slowly and chew well? Pro-digestion behaviors improve digestion and therefore reduce the amount of fermentable material reaching the potentially overgrowing microbes. Now, identifying and addressing underlying causes. There are at the very least 25 or 30 possible causes that are linked to gut dysbiosis. And you want to rule out as many as possible so that you can focus in on the elephants in the room for your case. Through my consultation practice, I spend a good chunk of time on this with my clients because the root cause analysis in implementing strategies based on the findings improve resolution and help prevent recurrence. Remember, SIBO, CIFO, LIBO, or EMO are not infections, so the concept of killing bacteria, fungi, or methanogens with pharmaceutical or herbal antibiotics is not necessarily a sound solution unless your symptoms or your condition is so serious that in fact you, you need to use antimicrobials. But in most cases, that would really be a second or third line of treatment in my view. Dietary supplements are an important part of treatment for gut dysbiosis and need to be managed judiciously. Over supplementing, taking the wrong supplements, or taking poor quality supplements can result in more harm than benefit. I review all of the supplements my clients take and often find that there is little real science backing up the supplement or the risks outweigh the benefit. Another challenge is the sheer number of supplements some people take. Reducing the number of supplements, ensuring they're produced by reputable companies, being stored properly, and having some science to back them up are things to consider. To give this four-part strategy a try, I suggest you read the Fast Track Digestion IBS book and try the Fast Track Diet mobile app. Fast Track Diet is a system to quantitatively limit fermentable carbohydrates in your diet based on a calculation and a point system. This approach also helps you evaluate underlying causes, address your symptoms, improve your digestion, and put your microbes on a diet, thus helping your own control mechanisms bring your microbes back into balance. There are several diets for SIBO or other forms of dysbiosis, but the Fast Track Diet is the only diet that quantitatively limits the full spectrum of fermentable carbohydrates, including lactose, fructose, the many types of fiber, resistant starch, and sugar alcohols except for erythritol. Limiting these types of fermentable carbs is supported by the NICE guidelines based on Cochrane reviews and the textbook of primary and acute care medicine. Here is a good il illustration about how the Fast Track Diet covers the full spectrum from plant-based diets to carnivore as well as fasted. In other words, fewer of these fermentable carbs or FP points on one end and many more on the other on the other end. To create an actionable and integrative roadmap for relief and recovery based on your specific case, you can contact me at digestivehealthinstitute.org. If you like this video, please subscribe and thank you for watching.